Okay, welcome everybody to lecture number two from the Jewish Council of North Central Florida. Also, thank you to our sponsor, Florida Humanities. We would not have been able to bring this series to you without their help. And we are offering One Nation Under God, Religion's Impact on the United States. For those of you that were here for the first lecture two weeks ago, we had, uh, we had Armin Langer on the American presidency, bias and anti-Semitism. If you missed that, I've, we have a YouTube page. If you don't know how to find it, or you can't find it in the links that I've sent to you, just reach out to me via email and I'll send you the link. But today it's all about Dr. Ken Wald. And I'm going to turn it over to one of our board members, uh, Stuart Cohn. And Stuart, take it away and introduce uh, your dear friend, Ken, who's also on our board, by the way. And uh, I hope to see you again in a few weeks. A bit of housekeeping, please keep yourself muted. If we have time, we will take some questions and answer at the end. Uh, preferably to press the little hand button to raise your little hand in the form of graphic and then I will call on you um, and there will be a short poll near the end of this lecture so please hang on while we run that because we are grant funded and they like to get feedback on these things so it's part of our grant responsibility. So with that Stu take it away. I'm going to mute uh, myself. Uh, thank you Linda and uh, good evening everybody. As Linda has said I'm Stuart Cohn. I'm a board member of JCNCF, the Jewish Council of North Central Florida. I'm really very pleased to be introducing my friend and tonight's speaker, Ken Wald, Professor Ken Wald. We could have searched high and wide for a speaker on the subject of religion in American politics, but could not have found anyone whose credentials match those of Professor Wald. He's right here at the University of Florida and right here in Gainesville. In fact, almost my neighbor down the block. Professor Wall literally helped turn this subject into a major academic discipline. His groundbreaking textbook on religion in American politics is now in its ninth edition. He's lectured on the subject at such varied places as the University of Strathclyde, Haifa University, Hebrew University, and Harvard University, and has received research grants from the National Science Foundation and Fulbright programs in Israel and Germany. We're very fortunate to have Ken in our community, and thank you to JCNCF for arranging this series. And without more, Professor Ken Wald. Great, thank you. Thank you, Stu. Um, can everyone hear me at this point? We're good. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me begin by thanking all of you uh, who've taken time out of your schedule to hear this talk this evening. Uh, and a special thanks to Linda, uh, who should receive the credit for conceiving of the idea of this kind of lecture series, uh, for recruiting the participants, and last but certainly not least, for raising the funding that it has enabled us to promote this, not just in the Gainesville area, but uh, throughout uh, uh, other places as well. Uh, and I'm honored to, to speak with you. Um, this evening, I'm going to be talking about how the founders of the United States created a unique system, uh, what we call a regime of religion and state that regulated the relations between those two entities um, through the U.S. Constitution. I'm going to talk about uh, why they created a system of this nature uh, and talk about the impact it's had on religious freedom uh, in the United States. Um, as it happens, I'll be lecturing in another three weeks for those of you who uh, aren't overdosed at this point uh, or after this talk, any event, uh, about the threats to the regime of religion and state, which I see as significant uh, in the contemporary period. But tonight I'm just going to be talking about how the system was built uh, in which religion and state seem to coexist in a relatively happy relationship in the United States. Uh, I wanna stress that I'm not gonna be talking uh, at great length about the Jewish experience. Uh, Jews were, in a sense, the objects of much of this effort. They were not really major actors at the time of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, they had not yet gained sort of their political footing, uh, but they did certainly benefit greatly. But I'm going to talk about that in the broader sense of the impact of the Constitution on religious minorities. So um, let's start um, by talking about the challenges that the American founders, by which I mean the people who designed the constitution, 
by the challenges they faced when they got together in Philadelphia to try to create a new political system for what had been a group of independent colonies, very loosely linked by something called the Articles of Confederation. The Articles effectively did not create a central government strong enough to do the things we expect a government to do. The central government could not even raise enough funds to provide troops when there were threats to political order, a rebellion uh, that occurred in some of the colonies. Uh, and it was clear that the task of the founders was to strengthen the central government that had been created under the Articles. So that was their priority. But at the same point, they were constrained by the recognition, as they were realistic men, uh, men at the time, uh, they were constrained by the recognition that the states, uh, formerly the colonies that would now become the states, were constrained, uh, were jealous of their prerogatives, and they did not want to give all their power to the states. So the founders had to balance the interests of the states, but at the same time create a central government that could do what we expect governments to do. And they particularly wanted to create a government that was a republic a system in which individuals would be represented through the electoral process. And because the electoral process is determined by majorities, that would reflect the wishes of a majority of citizens who voted in the elections. So that was their task. But because the founders were in general well-educated, they knew that the history of republics, the systems that could maintain a democratic system uh, through representation. That history was not a happy one. And you have the problem that when majorities were given authority, uh, they often uh, engaged in what was called the tyranny of the majority. Uh, majorities would assume they could do anything they wanted, regardless of what minorities thought or what they were supposed to, the rights they were supposed to have. And so it was a very difficult balancing act that the founders faced, balancing the rights of the majority but guaranteeing uh, the rights of minorities as well. And Thomas Jefferson, I think, said it best when he said, though the will of the majority must in all cases prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable. That the minority possess their equal rights, which equal law must protect and to violate would be oppression. So in the sphere of religion, how do you balance the religious needs and values of the majority with the religious needs and values of the minority, which are supposed to be protected by the Constitution. So it was a task requiring very careful and sophisticated statecraft. And I think we are lucky to have had the founders we did, although they were by no means broadly representative of the population. They were all white, all male, all virtually well-educated and affluent. Nonetheless, they fashioned a system which I would argue has been very effective uh, over the last 200 years. So it is important to understand, though, when we talk about the system of religion and state that we have, to recognize that it's not simply the product of intellectual debate and discussion. Uh, rather, there were interests involved. And those interests had a lot to do with the kind of system and the kind of challenges the founders were dealing with. The founders understood from their study of republics in the past that there tended to be a relationship between religious conflict and differences on the one hand and political stability on the other. Many of the republics that, been, that had been established in the past had failed because of religious conflict. And indeed, religion is often associated with war and conflict. One only has to think of the Hundred Years' War in Europe. There were additional concerns and fears beyond this general concern about the possible toxic effect of religion on democratic government. And in particular, there was conflict among the many religious groups that existed in what was to become the United States. Uh, America at that time was remarkably pluralistic in its religion. There were lots of different religious organizations and religious believers. Of course, Christians. Uh, sorry, uh, Christians were the majority of the population insofar as we can determine, 
but Catholic, but, but Protestant Christians were the single largest component. Uh, there were other Protestant groups, uh, in particular Baptists and Methodists, who were transplanted from England to the U.S., who had particular concerns about what religion, what role re religion would play in the new republic. And in particular, they were concerned that the new constitution might create a national religion, uh, an established religion that was recognized as an official religion, uh, and that this religion would impede the ability of these other Protestant Christians to do the things they wanted to do. So much of the drive to separate religion and state came out of the fear of these other religions, the upstart sects, as they were sometimes called, that the wrong religion was going to be established if a religion were to be established, that is given public authority. And so their goal became not just stopping a particular church. Uh, in many cases, it was the Church of England, which was the established church in many of the colonies and remained so uh, after the revolution. Uh, it wasn't just that, it was just better to have no religion established officially than to have the wrong religion in control of the levers of power. And again, the goal of the founders was to build a new national state. And consequently, their concern about religion was how it might undermine that effort. Now, to avoid the failures that had occurred in other republics, again, as I said, they realized the need to protect the rights of religious minorities, which meant limiting the authority of the majority. The majority could be the majority of numbers, but there were areas on which it couldn't trespass, namely those rights that the Constitution guaranteed all citizens. Their central solution was simply to create a secular state. I'll be explaining what I mean by secular state in a moment. And I think, again, from the perspective of 200 years, we can see uh, that the system they fashioned, largely out of necessity, really has benefited religious minorities in the United States, none more so than American Jews. But even more broadly, many people believe that the vitality of religion in the United States, where it is much stronger than almost any comparable advanced industrial society, owes much to the fact that religion is outside the sphere of government. And therefore, religious entrepreneurs are able to emerge, to create new religions, to fashion techniques that work. Uh, and this has, again, made the United States very distinctive when you look at the other nations of the globe. So recognizing the role of interest, it's also important that we look at the ideas that were current uh, when the Constitution was being written in the late 18th century. Now, most of the people who were active and influential in the founding of the United States, in the writing of the Constitution, in the writing of the Bill of Rights, which occurred shortly thereafter, and in carrying the Constitution into law, most of those founders had been exposed to this intellectual movement that came mostly from France in the 17th and 18th century. And I'm referring here to the Enlightenment, as it was generally known, something that I'm sure many of you learned about in your world history classes. The founders of the United States learned about the Enlightenment. Many of them attended uh, elite universities, which were almost all founded by religious communities. And they would, many of them could read multiple language. They could read the leader of the uh, uh, Enlightenment, Voltaire, in the original French. Uh, and so they imbibed many of the ideas of that movement, which seemed to challenge the traditional role of religion as a factor that was part of the state and supporting the state. Uh, there was a nice summary of Enlightenment thinking that I recently came across, uh, and it explained that the Enlightenment uh, advocates were driven most of all by the belief that human beings were endowed often by God with the capacity for reason and rational thought. And they should utilize that reason to uh, assess knowledge. Uh, the individuals should be free to engage in any inquiry they wanted to, again, because they were guided by reason. They should have individual liberty. They should recognize that political institutions were not created by God, but created by humans for other humans. And they should fashion governments that did not get involved in things where government simply had no competence. 
And one of the conclusions they, they made is that the traditional integration of religion and church was not a good thing and should be challenged. We recognize now, mostly from the work of the journalist Gary Wills, that the founders perhaps were even more influenced by a particular version of the Enlightenment that reached North America from Scotland, of all places. And this came about in the 18th and 19th century. And probably the leading exponent of the Scottish Enlightenment was an Englishman, ironically, uh, John Locke, who had an important role in the American Revolution. And as Locke pointed out, the religious organizations had tasks to perform. They should promote morality. They should promote public order. But in many cases, they did not have the competence to engage in other activities. And so religion really should not be talking about science. And as much as possible, it should not be involved in political and social life. And they believe that even the search for morality should not be dominated by the churches and certainly shouldn't enjoy the power of the law behind it. Uh, rather, it should be uh, something that is achieved in a different sphere. So the founders came at this question, not only with the constraints that I talked about and the fears they had about what might happen if religion was given state power, uh, but also by uh, the dispositions they picked up from their exposure to the enlightenment. And we see just how powerful these views were if we look at arguably the two most important founders, the people whose fingerprints really had more to do with the writing and the implementation of the United States Constitution. And here I mean, most of all, James Madison, who is rightly the, considered the father of the Constitution, and George Washington, who was our first president, of course, but is also considered the father of the nation. Now, I often notice that people credit Washington with writing the Constitution, which is absolutely wrong. He was the president of the Constitutional Convention, and his stature and support for it largely accounted for its success. Uh, but the Constitution was designed by, organized by, and even today we depend on the notes of James Madison. I have to point out that uh, this is yet another case where a tall person, a freak of nature like George Washington, who was over six foot, uh, gets credit for something accomplished by a man who is five foot six inches tall, uh, which is coincidentally my height as well, that of course being James Madison. Um, the most important statement of how the founders thought, particularly those of Madison School, was an essay published three years before there was a US Constitution. The essay, written initially anonymously under the title Memorial and Remonstrance, was written by Madison in response to a proposal then set before the Virginia legislature of which Madison was an elected member. Uh, the governor of Virginia, who was then Patrick Henry, the man who famously said, give me liberty or give me death, was concerned about what he felt was the moral decline in Virginia uh, since the revolution. And he felt the way to fight this was for the state to allocate money that would pay for teachers of religion. And those teachers of religion would be sent around the state and make Virginians better Christians. Not just better Christians, but the established church in Virginia was the Church of England, the Anglican tradition. So this was to use public money to, in effect, impose a particular religion on the people of Virginia, whether they wanted it or not. And Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance is really a brilliant response to Henry's proposal. Uh, and what he said essentially in the quotation that you can read for yourself is that the state, and here I'm talking about the state of Virginia, but I could be talking about the United States. Madison said the state itself has no particular competence in matters of religion. The state has no insights that individuals don't have that allow it to distinguish religious truth from religious falsehood. And basically the state should stay out of religion. Religion exists in a separate sphere from the state and the state should simply do almost nothing involving religion. It shouldn't regulate, it shouldn't give it state authority. It should simply leave it alone. And in point of fact, it should treat religious organizations as corporations, nonprofit corporations for the most part, but not part of the governing apparatus. Madison's appeal was so successful that not only did the Virginia legislature not pass 
uh, Lee's proposal. They passed instead Thomas Jefferson's famous statute for the state of Virginia, which disestablished the Anglican church in the state. And it came out of this view by Madison, who it's worth pointing out, almost became a minister. It was a deeply and thoughtful religious person who felt that state authority would harm the religious organization rather than make society better. Then you had the experience of George Washington just three years later, shortly after he was inaugurated as president, the first president of the United States. Washington received many letters from organizations and citizens upon his inauguration. Uh, and he answered all of them or his, his staff did so. And one of the letters came from the Presbyterian ministers of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, uh, who were, as I said, the Presbyterian clergymen of those particular states. And they, when they wrote to Washington, they praised him, they celebrated him as an individual who showed Christian piety in his behavior. Um, and they noted his heroism in the revolution. They again gave him credit for the constitution, which belongs to Madison. Uh, but they said at one point, they had a problem with the constitution. Even though they didn't like it, they were okay with a clause in the constitution, which said that membership in or, or election to a position of authority in the national government would not require religious oath. They said that, that they thought it should, but they could accept that. But what they couldn't accept, they said, was the absence in any of the constitution of any reference to God and Jesus, who they said were the real foundation and inspiration for the United States. Well, Washington got their letter and he responded, I think, in a, in a sort of a deadly short comment that says an awful lot. Uh, he thanked the ministers for their kind words, and he, and he congratulated them on their successful efforts to try to raise the moral standards of the American public. But he said, and this is the, the dagger that goes in, the path of true piety is so plain as to require but little political direction, i.e. it was the job of the clergy to raise moral standards. It was the job of the government to preserve moral order. Those were different tasks that were allocated to different institutions. And he went on to say that it was because that sense that, that, that religion didn't need the power of the state behind it, uh, that rather than hostility or indifference to religion, that explained why the constitution said virtually nothing about religion. So you have the designer of the constitution, the most important political figure and, and the most important political figure at the time, both making clear that they did not want the state to have governing authority uh, or official status under the Constitution. Now, how did they implement this? Well, what they did over the course of the Constitutional Convention and then afterwards through the uh, effort to create the Bill of Rights was to create what we would call a classic liberal regime of religion and state. Now, the term liberal at the time, the 18th century, did not have the meaning it has today. Uh, liberal referred more to limited government than anything else. And what they did is create a government that was limited uh, almost completely in its religious authority. And that regime, I would argue, still exists, although I think it's in trouble uh, because of some Supreme Court decisions over the last 15 years or so. But let's talk about what in the Constitution implements a system of religion and state where the two are allocated to separate spheres. Uh, the best advice I ever got about interpreting the constitution came from a colleague in another university uh, who said to me, Ken, when you're interpreting the constitution, never interpret one part of it without reading all the other parts of it because the constitution is not one word or phrase, it's a variety of mechanisms and you need to see all of them to get a sense for what the founders were doing. So let's see what the constitution did. We'll start with citizenship, which is a legal status that entitles someone to participate in public life. Um, all, all residents are entitled to the protections of the constitution, but only people as citizens are allowed to participate in the deliberations. It was very common at the time for citizenship to be dependent on a person's religion. Uh, for example, even in Rhode Island, which was by far and away the most tolerant of all the colonies, 
Uh, Jews were welcome to live in the colony, subsequently the state, but quote, being not of our people, they didn't enjoy political or civic rights. The constitution in the fourth amendment made it very clear that the rights in the constitution were to be shared equally by all citizens. And the basis of citizenship should not be blood or soil. Blood referring to a person's background, including their religion, soil based on the number of years or their, they and their family had resided in the place. Citizenship was to be applied equally to all who were capable of exercising it without regard to religion or social background. So in a sense, it's what the, that, that Article 4 didn't say that in some ways established the norm that religion and citizenship were not to be connected. This wasn't absolute because uh, some groups were in fact denied citizenship because of their religion or their ethnicity, but the principle was well established. The most explicit reference to religion in the original constitution comes in article six, and it's a negative one. Article six ends with the phrase that no religious test shall be required for a position of public responsibility under the United States. Now, what they meant here is they were writing a rule for the national government. The states, the former colonies, were in fact not covered by these restrictions at first. And indeed, it was very common in the colonies and then in the states to have religious tests. Sometimes you had to have a particular religious identity. You had to be, let's say, a Christian. Uh, but not a Catholic Christian. You had to be a Protestant Christian. Sometimes it was theology. There was one state uh, where in order to be a, a, a whole public office, you had to affirm the divinity of Jesus Christ. Another state, I believe it was Pennsylvania, had the rule that you had to believe in a future state of rewards and punishment, i.e. heaven and hell. So there were all kinds of religious oaths which kept people uh, unable to achieve public office through election or appointment or otherwise. The federal constitution as the last uh, phrase in article six in paragraph three simply said, we're not going to have those. And most of the states and colonies got rid of their religious oaths fairly quickly. So the one ref explicit reference to religion in the original constitution is negative, not positive. The final aspect of religion in the original constitution that I find striking were the oaths of office, which the uh, constitution prescribed for the president and members of Congress. There were oaths which end, of course, with the famous commitment of the person who's uh, uh, announcing it uh, as, you know, they will do their best, they will do their duty to protect the constitution of the United States. There is not, no reference to religion in the oath, which means those of you who uh, think about the oath are going to say, well, what about the fact that the person is uh, swearing on a Bible that's being held by whoever is administering the oath? The fact of the matter is there's nothing in the oath, nothing in the legislative history that commands that individuals swear on anything. It's, it's purely a cultural habit. It has no legally binding nature. Moreover, people are in fact not required to swear an oath, which is often seen as a religious act. Those of you familiar with the, uh, 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 some of the traditions in Judaism know that one thing that happens on the Day of Atonement is all oaths that you've not been able to fulfill are, uh, are suspended. Uh, instead of requiring somebody to swear on a Bible an oath, people were allowed to affirm that they would do all the things that the oath said. And to affirm is to use one's own judgment to decide this is the right way to behave. It's, it's, it gives people who are not religious or not theistic a way to uh, uh, accept the burden of office uh, without violating their scruples. So nothing in the original constitution that suggested this was going to be a Christian nation in any respect or to have any religious identity. Obviously, three years later, that changed when the, when the uh, Bill of Rights was added. And the Bill of Rights begins, of course, with Article One, and the first topic of Article One is religion. Some people today thus refer to religion as the first freedom because it was the first one explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. The First Amendment reads that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting 
the free exercise thereof. This language is a, is a beautiful illustration of something we learned from the distinguished political philosopher, Isaiah Berlin, who said, when you're talking about freedom, you have to keep in mind there are two different kinds of freedom. There is freedom from something that you don't want to do or don't think you should be asked to do. And there is freedom to do something that is consistent with your values and practices. And the two religion clauses together make it very clear that the government cannot establish a religion, cannot give a religion official standing, cannot provide it with the authority of government. So religion as organization really gets nothing out of the First Amendment, or very little. On the other hand, it's, it's, it gives individuals freedom from a religious organization or religious uh, behavior that they may not want to follow. The second part of it, the uh, ensuring the free exercise of religion gives individuals the freedom to act religiously on the basis of whatever they believe. It is their beliefs and they are free to act consistently with their beliefs. It's freedom to rather than freedom from. It's important to understand that none of the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights is meant to be absolute. Uh, Justice Holmes stated this brilliantly when he said that the First Amendment uh, does not confer the right to yell fire in a crowded theater because the goal of government is to preserve public order and obviously yelling fire when the theater is crowded could endanger public order. And similarly, free exercise, although it's very widespread, has its limits. Uh, you may happen to belong to a religious community that believes the U.S. should sacrifice virgins in the hope of appeasing an angry God. And under the, the, the free exercise, you're entitled to believe that. Uh, you're entitled to say you believe that. But as the Supreme Court decided in 1876, you are not entitled to do that because that is inconsistent with public order. Uh, the case actually that decided this, the first major case on religion, was actually about plural marriage, uh, and it prohibited uh, uh, plural marriage in the territory of Utah, uh, despite the fact that Mormons uh, at the time believed that this was the will of God. And again, they can say that, they can believe it, but if they engage in the behavior, if they do actually undertake plural marriages, they are violating the law and can be punished. In any event, you look at these features together, and it's really clear that what the founders had in mind was a political system based on the idea of political secularism. Now, as I promised, we have to remind ourselves what the term secular meant then, as opposed to what it means now. Today, many people hear the word secular, and their conclusion is that to be secular is to be either anti-religious or irreligious. Those are secularists. Okay. Now, that's what secularism connotes to many individuals. But what it denotes, that is what it means according to the dictionary, to be secular is simply anything that is outside the sphere of religion. It simply recognizes religion and government as different spheres. And it is not, in fact, intrinsically hostile to religion or promoting religious difference. There certainly are people who call themselves secularists who are hostile to religion or indifferent to religion. But there are many more people who consider themselves religious, but are also secular. And they believe that religion is not part of the state and it should exist in its own separate sphere where the state should essentially not intervene. So the term secular in its proper meaning is a neutral term. A secular state, which is what the founders, I believe, intended to build, simply is a state in which when the state allocates benefits, let's say makes uh, uh, government tax money available, or when it imposes costs, things, limits that people can't do, those decisions should not be based on the religious affiliation of the people who are affected. The state in a sense should be agnostic. Benefits should be given to all who apply under the law. Costs should be apportioned based on the same criteria. Religion is not supposed to be part of that. And to the extent you have a state that follows those rules, the state can be said to be secular. Now, again, there are secular states which are anti-religious. Uh, France after the French Revolution, Mexico after the Mexican Revolution, 
Both were obviously hostile to religion, in this case, the Catholic Church, which they felt supported the tyranny of the monarchy, the king in France and the big landowners and aristocrats in Mexico. And so they wanted religion kept out of the state to the point that you couldn't even in the modern era in Mexico have a bumper sticker referring to religion on your car. Uh, the French were equally hostile to religion. They had a doctrine called laicite, uh, which made it clear that uh, people were Frenchmen um, who might happen to be Jews, but not Jewish. Uh, they, were, they were Frenchmen before they were Jews. It's also possible, and I think we have this in the United States, to have a state that is secular, but is friendly to religion. It doesn't necessarily promote it, but it doesn't get in the way. It's neutral. It tries to be neutral toward religion. And I think the United States is really the outstanding example of this kind of thing. Okay, so that's the, that's the, those are the tools the founders put in the document to create the system we have regarding the relationship between religion and state, it is why the government is not allowed to, uh, quote unquote, establish a religion, give it authority over individuals outside its own voluntary membership, but at the same time, the government is not meant to restrict religious freedom. Although where exactly you draw the line is sometimes difficult as Madison himself uh, admitted. So now the brief detour to the particular Jewish case. Um, in a book I published a few years ago, I had a chapter on how American Jews fell in love with the constitution. And the reality is, even though they were not really influential in the writing of the Constitution or its implementation, they embraced it with a fervor that is hard for us to recognize today. And they did so, frankly, because the Constitution gave Jews something they'd had nowhere else in their long history, both religious and civic freedom. That is, they were free to exercise their religious life under their own authority, they were free to open synagogues. They were free to do all the things that uh, uh, someone might do following the Jewish tradition. But at the same point, they were full members of civil society. They could vote, they could run for office, they could hold office. And many people felt that the Constitution was really uh, God-given, ironically enough, in that it gave Jews a position they had and enjoyed nowhere else. I would even argue that the Constitution gives Jews more pol political rights than the Israeli proclamation of independence gives to Jews, but that's a different argument for a different time. So American Jews developed a kind of theology of the constitution, what I call a, a political culture built around it. And they again start from the assumption that the task of the constitution is to govern public life, by which I mean political life only. It does not affect the religious life of people's, people or other things. It is a limited document about a limited subject matter. Secondly, and most importantly, the United States, according to the Jewish perspective, is not a Christian nation because the nation has no official religious identity. Indeed, the state has no religious identity at all, let alone a Christian one. Christians might be a majority, but that does not entitle them to any particular privileges not available to all other citizens. Um, and this became really central to the Jewish understanding of the United States and why it was such a beacon to Jews from other countries. It was not something that was viewed favorably by many Christians, although many others did do so. But nonetheless, the idea that the Constitution was created by human beings for human beings, it doesn't reflect in their minds a particular religious tradition, and that's the way it should be kept. As a corollary, Jews believe, based on uh, uh, the fourth uh, article, uh, that their status in the United States is that of an equal citizen with rights guaranteed by law. They are not, as the speaker two weeks ago said, a tolerated minority. And the problem with toleration is that tolerance is given in a sense in sufferance. But just as an authority can give tolerance, it can be taken away. So Jews were not interested in tolerance, even though they believe tolerance is better than intolerance. But what they wanted was the full rights of citizenship as all of their, uh, their neighbors had. And that's what they got in the Constitution. It didn't mean that there wasn't prejudice against them. Uh, but as a very smart political scientist, not me, wrote uh, a few years ago, uh, anti-Semitism in the US succeeded as prejudice, but failed as politics. 
and it never successfully limited the political rights of American Jewry. Jews also believed, and this is important, that they should illustrate the example by keeping religious language out of their political discussion. If Jews opposed a policy that they thought was going to be bad for Jews, or they wanted, say, the United States to intervene on behalf of their uh, persecuted brethren overseas, they should make this argument as citizens, not as Jews. They should not cite Jewish theology. They should cite understandings about basic human rights. And Jews followed this pattern for decades, always very careful in their language to say, we're not asking this as Jews, we're asking it as citizens of the United States. And not only should they themselves be a good example of keeping religious language out of political discourse, which they felt was always bad for Jews, Jews also had an obligation to defend this liberal regime, which gave them a better situation and more opportunity than they had had anywhere in the past, even in medieval Spain. Um, and it was their task to make sure that system didn't die. Now, I have a very lengthy chapter in that book I mentioned about this Jewish culture, but interestingly, after I finished that chapter, I stumbled across a, a, a two word uh, a comment from an unsigned editorial that captured it better than I did with all of my language. Uh, on Thanksgiving Day in 1911, uh, an editorial appeared unsigned in the American Hebrew, uh, a Jewish newspaper in New York. And it said, quote, the rights of all citizens must be determined in the light of their citizenship, regardless of their religious affiliations. And the maintenance of this principle as a principle is a sacred obligation upon us. So Jews believe they inherited an obligation to make sure that the favorable circumstances they enjoyed would not disappear, that the constitution would continue to do this, to give them the rights that they need. So fundamentally, looking back over the founders' challenges and their effort to balance the rights of minor religious minorities with religious majorities, it's fair to say that the Constitution has effectively given important support to religious minorities, groups like Jews, Muslims, and other religious groups, and to the growing proportion of Americans who are now labeled as religious nuns, people who say they, when asked, what, you know, do you have a religious uh, commitment or affiliation or identification? Many people now say no. In fact, it's the fastest growing religious community, and arguably it may now be a plurality of Americans. Uh, any event, um, in general, the system has been largely favorable to those minorities. It's certainly been favorable to the majorities, but it has certainly given those minorities opportunities to protect their own religious needs and interests. It's also important to note that while the executive branch and the uh, legislative branch have been important, it's probably the case that the legal system established by the Constitution and the courts who implement it have really been the most common venue where religious minorities has, have obtained justice. And that's not surprising because unlike the executive branch headed by an elected president or the legislature headed by elected representatives, both of whom are presumed to represent majorities, the legal system is supposed to be governed by the principles of the law and the number of people supporting a position or opposing it is not supposed to matter. And like African-Americans who depended on the Supreme Court to help give them the rights that they were denied for centuries, uh, like uh, gay and lesbian Americans who obtained the right to marry through the courts because the majoritarian wings of government were not willing to take that step alone. Uh, Jews too have generated a lot of important decisions in their favor through the legal system. Uh, more of those decisions have actually come for Jehovah's Witnesses than any other religious group. Uh, they really, more than any other minority, have established uh, by their lawsuits the, the status and rights of minorities. But for Jews, the legal system has probably been the most reliable support uh, compared to any of the others. When I speak again in three weeks, I'm after this generally optimistic talk, I'm gonna be a lot more pessimistic because when I look at the future, I see some trends that really worry me about the extent to which religious equality and therefore religious freedom are going to be maintained. I see a series of troubling decisions that the court has issued under its current majority 
that to my mind raise questions about whether the balance we've achieved between majorities and minorities um, in matters of religion has in fact uh, been undermined to the point uh, that the country is going to develop a very different system. But that's for three weeks. So at this point, I'll be quiet. Thank you for your patience and turn the program back over to Linda. Thank you so much, Ken. That's a lot of information and I hope that everybody absorbed it. We have a few minutes before we end for the evening. If anybody has any questions, uh, please think about it. Raise your hand with a little yellow hand. In the meantime, while we are thinking, I'm going to also launch a poll. Um, does anybody, I'm looking at the participants, does anybody have a hand up? meaning not your physical hand, because I may not see your physical hand since I only have a few people on the screen. But um, I am launching a poll. Please take a minute to answer it. Um, and think, oh, somebody's applauding, okay. Does anybody have any questions, comments? You've stunned them into silence, Ken. I guess that means I that- think, I think. I think, Linda, there's a question in the chat. Uh, take a look at the chat there. Hang on, let me see. Well, while Linda's looking, let me just add, um, you're welcome to email me if you'd like to have a conversation about some aspect of this. And while I neglected to put it on the slide, my email address is fairly simple. It's Kenwald, one word, no capitalization, K-E-N-W-A-L-D, at ufl.edu. And if you didn't get that, you can always email me and I can connect you. Um, that wasn't a question, actually, Stu. It was just uh, Linda Bobroff saying, hi, I see so many people I know. <laughs> um, anybody have any other questions or comments? Uh, Richard, well, I did have a, yeah, Go. Linda, I did have a question. I did put it into the chat. Maybe it's not, doesn't, maybe I didn't do it right. And um, the Church of England still exists without a constitution in England. But I've not noticed that there's any political or religious hindrances in England, unless maybe it's more subtle than, I, than I'm able to pick up. Has there been any studies at all in terms of the impact in England or the fact that they still have a state church? Um, there's less and less um, indication that they have a state church. Um, and indeed, a few years ago, one of the one of the aspects of the uh, Church of England uh, uh, in a in a law passed by uh, Parliament, you know, centuries ago, was that the heir to the throne could not marry anyone uh, who was a uh, who was not Christian uh, and who was not an Anglican, um, which has famously led to you know a number of a number of uh, crises in, in history. And Parliament, um, uh, 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 I'm forgetting the word, but they got rid of that law. So there's very little evidence that the Church of England uh, uh, exercised much authority. Indeed, the most recent English census, a British census, shows, and, and this is, these are words that come from the most sober religious uh, demographers who you can imagine, that religion is almost dead in the UK. Um, the number of believing people or the number of people who behave religiously without believing uh, has gotten to the point where it's unlikely that it'll even be in double digits before long. And that's not unusual. You see much of that in Scandinavia and elsewhere. And I think, again, what it suggests is all those religious groups have historically been linked to the state, uh, even if it's weaker now. And one of the real strengths of the American system is people may be angry at the state, angry at government, but so since religion isn't a part of that mechanism, it escapes that anger. Whereas in other places, if you're mad at the state, you're probably gonna be mad at the church as well. But you're right, it's, it's a much less important factor in the UK and England uh, than it used to be. Thank you for that. There are two other questions. Uh, one from Dick Howard that says, please comment on the use of God on our currency, Pledge of Allegiance and the National Christmas tree. And then we have another question after that. Yeah, um, there are some practices in the United States that uh, would appear to involve the state possibly endorsing or promoting religion in some form. Uh, and many of these have been challenged in the courts and the courts often say that, well, these are just examples of ceremonial deism. They're not really important statements. Um, and none of the doctrines about 
how you decide when the, the separation of religion and state has been violated, um, how you should decide the cases, what are the principles. And they've generally argued these are not important enough to really deal with. Uh, they are symbolic, they are cultural, and they don't really seem to hinder anybody. Now, again, people who are non-religious or of different religions might well disagree, uh, but the court has generally allowed room for, again, what they call ceremonial deism. There are many people who actually think to, to, to justify these practices in those terms is actually insulting to religion. I mean, that's when you think about it, uh, to say that, well, in God we trust is our motto is, is just a cultural norm, kind of seems to me disrespectful to religion. Uh, but there are people who are, it's so important to them that the state appear to support religion that they'll take it, even if it, as I said, seems rather disrespectful. Um, you know, the court has not ruled in favor of the critics in any of those decisions. The Declaration, uh, the uh, uh, Pledge of Allegiance is one of those that could come back. The original decision by the court was procedural, that the father of the young girl on whose behalf he was pleading that he wasn't the custodial parent, so he didn't have the right, he didn't have standing uh, to file the case on behalf of his daughter. Uh, but a case like that might come back. But given the current majority of the court, I see no way they would uh, accept it or they would rule uh, in favor of a plaintiff. Okay, we have another question from Stephen Barb Lande. Um, what were the religious beliefs of those that wrote the Constitution? Well, you're talking about a group of people uh, who were quite divergent in their backgrounds. They were, for the most part, elites. They were wealthy. They were white. They were male. Um, and there was, in that sense, a certain degree of commonality. Uh, we don't have good data on the religious affiliation. And you had certainly at one extreme people like Thomas Jefferson, who, though uh, he was in theory an Anglican, um, was a believer in that there had been a creator. And he also believed that Jesus was uh, uh, you know, the Messiah, but he, he wrote a Bible in which he took out all of the miracles uh, that were attributed to Jesus because he was a rationalist and he said there's you know, natural laws and you know, if you take all these things out, you get the real important Jesus who's, who's an ethicist, uh, who talked about how human beings can live together in, in, in humanity. And he was a, a, you know, again, he was a, a rationalist, but he considered himself a religious person, albeit not a traditional one. And one of the members of Congress who was sworn in a couple of years ago swore his oath on Jefferson's Bible, the Bible that takes all the, you know, the miracles, the virgin birth, the water and the wine, takes him out of, out of the Bible too, which was kind of interesting uh, uh, in, that, in that process. Um, we suspect that, uh, again, uh, again, most of them were probably Protestant Christians. We know, of, I think, only a few Catholics who were involved, and we're not even sure about those. Uh, so in that sense, they came from different places with different norms. Uh, probably the places that had the Church of England established mostly had Anglicans. Uh, but there were other colonies which didn't have establishments or had plural establishments where you'd get different varieties of Protestants. But it was a white Protestant male group in its, in its uh, main. They were, in general, very well read on matters of religion. Many of them had been trained in theology at the universities where uh, that was often the, the major subject. Uh, so in that sense, they could have very interesting and important religious discussions. And that's also true of the battle over ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, where you have that as well. But beyond that, it's really hard to say much. There is a famous myth that at the time of the Constitutional Convention, the convention had deadlocked on some issue. And they feared that because they couldn't get a majority to support a position, that the whole convention would fall apart. And the myth has it that Benjamin Franklin, of all people, stepped forward and said, we're out of loggerheads. What we need to do is ask for the intervention of the divine. And he therefore proposed that they secure a minister of the gospel to um, uh, utter a prayer on behalf of their successful uh, 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 conclusion of their effort. Uh, the myth has it that the members were swept away, voted, and you know, a minister came in and you know, the, the problems were resolved. In point of fact, what happened when you looked at the record, uh, the motion died for lack of a second. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but people, there, there are a lot of people who really want there to have been a strong Christian emphasis at the time of the Constitution and in the Constitution. 
Um, and so they often make the founders more religious than many of them were. Uh, they were religious, but again, they were, you know, they were also intellectuals. And so their approach to religion was fairly sophisticated as a rule. That's the best I can give you. Very interesting. If, uh, if there are no more questions, then we are going to say thank you so much to Ken. And we can't wait to hear the next lecture in the series, which is coming up with my form. The next one on March 8th is Religious Freedom in America, which you alluded to a couple of times. So we look forward to that. Um, uh, if you're registered for this one, I think you're registered for the next one, but go ahead and register again. I will send the email to everybody that I have their registration information. And I will also send you the link to this, uh, to this recording, which will also take you to the link from the first class recording if you missed that. Uh, spread the word, tell people about it, and invite more people to come and listen. Um, Ken, thank you so much. Stu, thank you for your introduction, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Have a great night and great weekend. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ken.